Whether you're shooting with an enthusiast level or a professional level Nikon DSLR, you're going to have a similar menu system as the one you're looking at right now. So you're going to have the main menus, which in this case we have playback menu, shooting menu, custom setting menu, setup menu, retouch menu, and my menu. And some of the newer Nikon DSLRs will actually have a dedicated tab for video. Now this is the Nikon D810, which is a professional level full frame camera. So if you have something like a Nikon D7200, whether it's DX or full frame, the settings are going to be very similar. Now you might have some things on one camera and then maybe less menu items on another camera, but most of the settings should be very similar. So let's start with the playback menu. Now when you go through the settings, sometimes you might wonder what a particular menu setting does. Well, it's really easy to look it up. There is a question mark button on the back of the camera which you can press and if you just continue holding it, it will tell you what that function is for. So in this case, you can see that this particular function deletes all or selected images. Now, under playback menu, there's not a whole lot that I personally like to change. And keep in mind that in this section of the video, what I want to do is I want to show you what I personally use and what works for me. But in for different individuals and for different types of photography, you might actually have to go back and change a few settings. But these are some of the things that I do on every single camera that I own and use. So in the playback menu, what I do is I go to the display options and here I typically just select two settings here. I've got highlights checked and overview. And the reason why I do that is if I go ahead and check everything here and click OK, if I play back an image, sometimes I just want to see basic exposure information and maybe just the blinkies in an image. Well, in this case, if I press the up or down button on the back multifunction, you can see there's a lot of different stuff here to go through. There's all these RGB histograms, there's white balance information, there's all this stuff here, which I really don't want. So what I'm gonna do is I typically just go into the display options turn off most of this data and only leave highlights and overview. Highlights give me the blinkies and overview gives me the basic exposure information. So right now I'm gonna click OK and playback. Now if I press up, that is the, my basic exposure information along with the histogram if I wanna look at it. And if I press up one more time, you can see that it's actually showing me the blinkies and that's the potential information that I'm gonna lose in an image. So those are the only two things that I enable. Next, I go down to image review. Now this one is usually turned on by default. And what this does is after you take a picture, it actually shows you what you've captured. So I usually leave this off. And the reason why I do that is because first, I don't wanna be chimping when I take pictures and concentrate more on my photography. And the second reason is I don't want to waste the battery of the camera. But if you want to review every image you capture, you can obviously turn it on. Okay, next is rotate tall. And here, the reason why I have this one turned off, by default, every Nikon DSLR will have this turned on. What this does is, if you look at a vertical image, look at all that wasted space from the left to the right. And I don't want that because I actually want to see more in the image. Now, by turning it off, all I have to do is rotate the camera and take a look at the image. And it's much easier for me to do that and see much more of the image than end up with all that blank space. So those are really the three things that I look here. The rest of the stuff is not that important. Next, we have the shooting menu. And as you can see, the first item we've got here is the shooting menu bank. Now, what this allows you to do is set up different presets. And as you can see, I've got landscapes, people. So you basically can create different presets for different types of photography. Now, the problem with the shooting menu banks in general in these cameras is that these settings only apply to the shooting menu bank. And as you will see later, not very useful. But if you wanted to create separate settings for say landscapes versus people, this is where you do it from. Now, if I come back, there's also another one that says extended menu banks. Now, what this does is it allows you on cameras without a mode dial. So like on a Nikon D800, D810, there's a button on the top of the camera that you press and you can change the camera mode. 
if you have one of those, you'll have a setting called extended menu banks. And here, if I have this turned on, it will allow me to save a specific camera mode. So if I want to shoot and say aperture priority mode for portraits or people, I can save that. And if for landscapes, I want to switch to say manual mode, then by en enabling this extended menu banks to on, I can switch my camera to manual mode and it will remember that. Next, we've got the storage folder. I wouldn't mess with this. This is basically the naming convention for the folder where your images are being saved. File naming, it, by default, it's DSC underscore whatever number is in the sequence. And some people like changing that. I don't bother. It doesn't really matter because when I import, all the files get renamed anyway. Next, we've got the primary slot selection. Now, this one is important because there are two different slots in this camera and different cameras will have different slots. For the Nikon D810, there's an SD card slot and there's a compact flash card slot. And here you select the primary slot. So whatever, let's say you put SD and CF cards in this camera. The, if, you, if I select SD card slot as the primary slot, whenever I take a picture, the first picture will go into the SD card slot. If I prefer to have pictures first stored on compact flash, then I select this. So just pick whatever works for you, whatever you prefer. Secondary slot function, this is another important setting because it allows you to set different types of uh, saving into the memory card. So the first setting is overflow and that's the one that's enabled by default. What this does is once your primary card fills up, it starts recording to the second memory card. So it only does it after the first one fills up. Now backup is actually a really cool one to use in situations where you want to preserve images. Make sure that if you lose one memory card or say the data in that memory card gets corrupt, you can actually back up the same image to two cards at the same time. So say you're shooting a wedding and you want to make sure that all images are in two cards at the same time, this is what you choose. The third option is not very useful for me personally, but I know that some sports photographers and maybe other photographers that work on commercial jobs like the setting because it allows you to save the raw image in the primary card and the JPEG gets saved in the secondary slot. So if you want to just give a JPEG image for someone to preview, you can just give them the memory card and then keep the RAWs for yourself. Now, image quality is really important. And this is probably the very first setting that I actually change on any new camera that I receive because this is where you set your image format. You can go from RAW plus JPEG to just RAW to JPEG. Well, if you've been shooting JPEG, you know you need to start shooting RAW. So I'm gonna go ahead and select RAW, but if you're not comfortable editing RAW yet, at least shoot RAW plus JPEG fine. You don't wanna be shooting normal or basic, either up top or on the bottom, because what it does is it reduces the resolution of the image. So you want to shoot at highest quality possible and highest resolution possible. All right, so I'm gonna select NEF RAW. Next, we've got JPEG slash TIFF recording. And here you basically set your preference for the image size and JPEG compression. Now, since I select raw, you can see that image size is grayed out. If I were to go back and change it to JPEG, then I would be able to choose between, between different sizes like large, medium, and small. You always wanna shoot large anyway. So under JPEG compression, if I ever were to shoot JPEG, then I would want optimal quality because I really don't care about size priority. I want the best quality. Next, we have NEF recording, and here you have multiple options. Well, for the Nikon D810, there is a unique setting. It's called image size, and from here, you can select raw L or raw S for large and small. And as you can see, this one allows me to capture at much higher, at maximum resolution at 36.2 megapixels, and the small one goes at 9 megapixels. I've written an article about this. There's no reason why you would ever want to shoot raw small. So try to pick raw large at all times unless you know exactly what you're doing. Next, we'll get uh, the NEF compression option. And here we have three options. Now on some cameras, you're not gonna have the third option. You're only gonna have the first two options. And what this allows you to do is set the compression on these raw images. The first option is on, which is basically for lossless compress. This one, you're shooting raw, you're preserving all the details and it's simply compressing the raw file. Next, you have compressed, which is basically a lossy compression, which means you're actually losing data. You do not wanna be using this. And the last option is uncompressed, which is 
not compressed raw file which contains the same amount of information as lossless compressed is just you end up with an image size that's almost twice bigger than lossless compressed there's simply no reason why you would want to go uncompressed so my recommendation is just choose lossless compressed all right so the last option is the nef raw bit depth we've got 14 bit and 12 bit 12 bit is a lot less colors versus 14 bit so you are retaining more information in a 14 bit image with this quality of a camera, in fact with any camera, if you have a setting between 12-bit and 14-bit, I would just pick 14-bit to get the best amount of information preserved in those raw files. Alright, next we've got image area. Now this one is going to be grayed out or not even available on DX cameras, but what you can do is on FX cameras or in a full frame camera, you can select different crop modes. So as you can see, the default option is full frame, then you can go 1.2x crop factor, dx, and then the different aspect ratio of 5 to 4. So I personally just choose fx, but let's say if you wanted to get closer and just utilize a smaller part of the image frame, you could choose between these different crop options. Now, keep in mind that whatever you choose, it's actually going to affect your raw image. So if you go with dx, it's going to make a much smaller raw file, which is going to capture much less resolution. Next we have Auto DX Crop. Now this is for lenses that are created for DX or APS-C sensor cameras like the Nikon D7200, D5000, 3000 series. If you have lenses that are specific to those cameras or that format, whenever you attach those lenses on a full frame, the camera in this mode right here will automatically chop out the corners and only use the image circle that's available on that lens. But if you wanted to turn that off, you could turn that off right here. By doing that, whenever you mount a, a DX lens, if the image circle is not big enough to cover the entire frame, you're just going to have a lot of dark corners in your images. So keep that in mind. I usually just have this turn on. All right, next we've got white balance. If you shoot raw, it doesn't really matter, but if you want to look at the result on the LCD, then you can choose from any of these templates or you can go preset manual. Auto is what I keep it on 99% of the time. Next we have picture controls and picture controls are basically different templates for images. And again, this doesn't affect your raw images. The only thing that affects if you shoot raw is the preview that you get on the LCD. So you've got standard, neutral, vivid, monochrome, all these different settings. I skip over those. I never actually touch them. And what I do is I basically have everything set to default. Now under in, inside each setting, as you can see, there's different adjustments. You can make quick adjustments, which have global effects on other settings like sharpening, clarity, contrast, and you can also go into individual ones and adju make adjustments. Now, what I don't do is I don't usually go too low on sharpening or too high on sharpening because if you go too high, a soft image might appear sharper than it really is. And if you go too low, then you won't know whether you had accurate focus or not just because it's just not going to appear sharp on the LCD. So I just go with a default setting of three. Clarity default setting one just works perfectly fine. And I don't mess with any of these here. Well, let me go back. If you wanted to, you could select between say vivid or landscape if you really want to boost those colors. But again, it doesn't really matter for raw. All right, next we've got picture control management. And from here, you can save your picture controls that you customize, or you can load and save them. Um, or load slash save, as you can says, you can copy to camera and you can delete from the card, things like that. I don't mess with any of that stuff because I don't care about the picture controls. Next, we've got color space. Now, the color space, they've got two options. There's sRGB and there's also Adobe RGB. If you're a JPEG shooter, which you shouldn't be, but if you are, just choose sRGB because that's the most compatible format that people can view and they can see. And if you shoot raw, I recommend choosing Adobe RGB. Now, the reason why I do that is because if I'm looking at a histogram, Adobe RGB is a much wider color space than sRGB. And whenever I look at a histogram, it gives me a more accurate representation than sRGB. And that's the only reason why I have this. Otherwise, it really doesn't matter because again, Color space is just extra bit of information. It doesn't get cooked into the raw file. Next, we've got all these settings like active D-lighting, HDR, vignette control, 
distortion control, long exposure noise reduction, high ISO noise reduction, all of that I turn off. And the reason why I do that is because active delighting, well HDR is, is grayed out because it's only applicable to JPEG anyway, but active delighting, vignette control, and distortion control, along with high ISO noise reduction, all of that also does not affect your raw images. The only one that actually does is long exposure noise reduction. And if you shoot really long exposures where the sensor can get potentially hot, this one, it's probably a good idea to turn that, keep that on, simply because what will happen is when you take a picture, it will take the double exposure. One is going to be the image, and as another one is going to be the reference image that just contains black space and, and all the noise that your sensor generates. Then it will minus out all the noise and you will end up with a cleaner image. So if you shoot really, really long exposures, and we're talking 30 seconds plus, it's a good idea to keep long exposure noise reduction on. Just keep in mind that it will take double the time to record images. All right, so here we come to ISO sensitivity settings, and this is a very important part of the camera setting because this one, I actually moved to my custom menu because I use this all the time. This is where you set your ISO sensitivity and you control the auto ISO setting. So here you want to be at ISO sensitivity 100 or 64 is the base, so stay in this range as much as possible. Now the base ISO for this camera is actually 64, so if it's a daylight situation and you're not running into low light conditions where you need to pick up the shutter, then just set it to 64. It's going to give you the best quality. Now, most cameras, though, won't have it 64. Most cameras, base ISO is 100. All these LO settings, they're basically boosted values. I would avoid using them because it's really not any lower sensitivity. But the higher the sensitivity, the worse the image quality gets, so stay at base ISO as much as possible. All right, next we've got auto ISO sensitivity control. And from here, you can actually regulate by turning it on. You can say, well, if the camera gets into a situation where the shutter speed is just really low, you can set the camera to automatically increase that shutter speed. So from here, I can basically select all these different sensitivities. I usually just pick 6400 as my maximum. On most cameras, it's probably as, as far as I will go because everything else is going to introduce too much noise. And But if on some cameras, like high-end cameras with a lower megapixel count, like the Nikon D4S, for example, you could go as high as ISO 12,000 or even 25,600 and still have amazing images. Uh, but like I said, 6400 is probably good for most full-frame cameras. If you're shooting DX, you might want to keep it at like ISO 3200. The minimum shutter speed is a really great setting, and in this camera in particular, you have an option for auto. Now, some of the older Nikon DSLRs will not have this option, but on every newer Nikon DSLR, you're going to have auto. Now, this is really cool because what it does is it basically follows the reciprocal rule where the shutter speed is going to be kept at the focal length of the lens. So say you're shooting with a 50 millimeter lens, by default, the camera will say, well, if the shutter speed drops below 1 50th of a second, it will start boosting the ISO to keep up with that. So if you don't have very shaky hands, it's probably just keep a good idea to keep it here. But if you have shaky hands, feel free to increase this. If I increase it by one, it basically doubles that minimum shutter speed to uh, on a 50 millimeter lens, it would go from 1 50th of a second to 1 100th of a second and going twice doubles it even more. So you're basically, your shutter speed would be set to 1 to 200th of a second. That's, that's, that's the minimum shutter speed before ISO starts to change. So I just go with this unless I'm shooting in specific conditions where I want to raise. Sometimes I'll just go one bar higher. All right, so from here, we're done with the ISO sensitivity settings. Now we go to different menu items like multiple exposure, interval time shooter, shooting, and all of that stuff. Really, I don't mess with that because these things are specific to specific environments. Like if you're doing time lapse, then you go into time interval timer shooting menu, um, or you're doing time lapse photography, there is a dedicated setting right there. Uh, movie settings is basically if you shoot movies, uh, you would select it from here. On some newer cameras like Nikon D750, Nikon actually took this entire section out in a separate tab here. But anyway, that's basically it with the shooting menu. Let's move on to custom setting menu.
Now here you also have custom settings banks and this is one thing that I don't like about the Nikon bank system on these higher end DSLRs is these two presets have to be created to duplicate these presets under the shooting menu bank. So I had to create two separate menu banks landscapes under two separate menus and I wish Nikon grouped them together so that you could just pick one landscape and then it would apply all the camera settings to that one preset. Unfortunately it doesn't work that way so all the settings that I have selected here for the custom menu banks they're only for the shooting menu and here they're only for the custom settings. So for that reason I don't use this anymore. This is just my old setting that I had in the camera because I just, it really irritates me that I have to do this in two places to switch from one shooting mode to another. So anyway, but if you wanted to do that, you could select these templates or, or presets and program them to whatever you want under the custom setting menu. All right, so here it's important to understand that there's all these different letters colored differently and they are main menus and there are sub menus under each one of them. So if I go under autofocus, I see A1, A2, A3, all these different settings here and that's under autofocus. Now if I keep scrolling down, I will eventually get to B1, which is basically going back, pointing to B metering slash exposure. So just keep that in mind. You can just go into one of these and scroll all the way down or if you want to take a shortcut, you can go from that main menu into different menus and it will jump as you can see between different settings within that big list of items. So let's go through these one at a time. It's going to take a little bit longer but it's worth it because it's a good idea to understand what each of these menu items do. All right, so here we've got A1. Now there's one thing that you really need to keep in mind. Whenever you make a change see that on the top of A there is now a star. Now what that indicates is that you actually change the default menu setting. So if I go back and set it to release as you can see there is no star which means that's the default setting that for the camera as when after, after I received it. And if I scroll down you'll see that most of these are not touched which means that by default it's not a problem if you just use everything like Nikon shipped you. You don't have to change these. For the most part, actually default settings work really well. All right, so A1, we've got AFC priority selection. That's for continuous mode. So if you're shooting in continuous autofocus mode, you've got three options. Now for some cameras, you're gonna have two options, just release and focus. In this particular case, there's release plus focus option as well. What this does is if you're shooting in continuous mode and you want the camera to fire no matter what, whether the subject is in focus or not, you can set it to release. Now, if you want to set it to release and focus, what this does is it will try to focus, but if it cannot focus, it will still shoot. So the priority is on release first. So we'll try to do release and focus at the same time, but it will still fire. Whereas in focus, the camera will refuse to shoot if your subject is not in focus. Now for shooting action, I always select either release or release plus focus just because I do not want to miss that action if the camera thinks that it's not in focus. In AFS priority selection, on the other hand, the default is focus and you only have two options here, release and focus. And here, what's basically happening is in AFS mode, in single server mode, your subject does not move and you want to prioritize focus. So if the subject is not in focus, the camera will refuse to shoot. And this is where you set it from. So the default action is focus and this is where I keep mine at. Next we've got A3 focus tracking with lock on. Now this one is more advanced. We're going to go over this in different videos, but don't worry about it. Just keep it at AF3 normal. Next we've got AF activation. Now this option is not going to be available on all the cameras, on cameras like Nikon D750 or anything lower where there's no dedicated AF on button on the back of the camera. You will only see one button. It's AEL slash AFL. And on those cameras that have only one button, you will not see this option. What this option does, it actually moves your focusing from half press shutter to the rear dedicated AF on button. So on this camera, I have that button and if I only wanted to focus using that button and I enable the AF on only, what happens here is the camera will never focus again 
whether I have pressed the shutter or not, I would have to press the AF on button on the rear of the camera. Why would you want to do this? Well, if you're doing the focus and recompose technique, this is where you set that setting in the back of the camera. So if you're shooting with a different camera and there's no setting here, you would have to find it in other parts of the menu. And most of them are going to give you that option. You just have to find it in a different place. So by default, I have my AF on only turn on because I mostly do the focusing using the rear button. All right, from here we'll go to AF A5 focus point illumination and you've got three settings. This is basically for you to be able to look through the viewfinder and uh, and see how the focus points are illuminated. So for example, in dynamic area A of display, which I have turned on by default, and this is the only one that I actually turn on, what happens is if you go say from 51 focus points to instead nine focus points or 21, if you're photographing wildlife and you only want your active autofocus points to be in one area and you want to keep it within that area, it, by turning this on, you will enable these dots around the active area, which can be really useful when you're, when you're shooting. So that's the only one that I have turned on. And on some cameras actually like this one, there is a setting for group area AF. And all this is just two different display types. This is just rectangle uh, that's empty and this one is full. Uh, I just go with the default, that doesn't really matter. All right, next we've got AF point illumination. Now you've got auto on and off. And what this setting does is if you go from say dark environment to light environment, if you choose auto, the camera will choose when to illuminate your focus point. So if you want to have that illumination at all times, which I want, I just select on. But if that annoys you, you can always turn it off or you can set it back to auto, which is a default behavior. All right, next we've got the focus point wraparound. I always keep this turned off because if I, if I turn it on, whenever you're on the far side of the focus area, if you press right, it then starts from the left side and I don't like that. All right, next we've got the number of focus points. You have two selections, 51 points and 11 points. With this high-end DSLR and the best autofocus system as of today with 51 focus points, there is no reason why you would want to do 11 points unless you know exactly what you're doing. All right, next we've got the store by orientation feature here. And what this does is actually a really neat feature. It's not available on older cameras, but it's available on all the newer cameras. So what it does is it allows you to select the, in this setting, you can basically save the orientation. So if you're shooting in landscape mode, for example, you're photographing a bride and you're photographing in landscape mode, if you switch to vertical and you still want the focus point on bride's face, well, if the moment you switch the orientation to vertical, you would have to move your focus point. With this setting enabled, you can actually make it so that the camera will remember whenever you change orientation. So you could switch from horizontal to vertical, from landscape to portrait mode, and the camera will store focus points separately for both of those, which is really neat. So here I can select focus point, which is only going to change the focus point. And there's another setting where it will actually remember the focus point and the AF area mode that you're shooting in. All right, so I have this usually turned at the focus point. Next, we've got the A10 built-in AF assist illuminator. Now, some cameras have this, other cameras don't, like the high-end Nikon D4, D4S series will not have that lamp in front of the camera. But if your camera does, you'll most likely have this option. What this allows you to do is you can turn that beam on or off. So if you're shooting in single mode, which is the only mode that this AF assist beam is, is available anyway, if you're shooting in AFS mode, if you want to turn off that lamp that flashes every time when, you, when you're focusing, then you can just turn it off from here. I just leave it by default, uh, which is set to on. All right, so limit AF area mode selection. This is something is, which is also available only on the newer cameras. And this is a really cool setting because in some situations, you do not want all these different options when you jump between different types of AF area selection. So for example, if you never choose nine and 21 points, and you never use 3D tracking, and you never use group area F, you could actually just select these two. And what that will do is once you save it, and when you press that button to go between different AF area modes, it will only display those two. So you can only toggle between those two. I usually just keep all these available, but if you're 
maybe annoyed by so many different options when you press that button and start changing the AFR modes. Just simply select or, or uncheck the ones that you don't use and you should be in good shape. The last setting is autofocus mode restrictions and here we have an ability to limit the type of autofocus mode that you use. Now, I don't know why you would want to do this, but say if you only shoot continuous action and you never ever want to be able to toggle between AFS and AFC, if you select AFC by pressing the auto autofocus mode button, you will not be able to see anything aside from AFC. Or if you only shoot stationary subjects and you never do continuous tracking, then you can just select AFS and that's the only mode that will be available for you to choose from. I don't do any of these. I, I want no restrictions because I use both AFS and AFC when I shoot, so I do no restrictions. All right, so now we are at B1, which at the very top now you can see we're under the metering slash exposure subtree. If I go back, you can see we're there. Now, from B1 to B7, there's different options, and I rarely, to be honest, ever touch these because I don't want to mess with the sensitivity step values, exposure control, just don't worry about these. Uh, unless you really know what you're doing. Now, there's one setting that you might want to use depending on you know which camera system you've been using before. If you're a Canon shooter and you convert it to Nikon, maybe this uh, might be a useful setting for you. So, easy exposure compensation. Basically, if you're annoyed by the fact that you have to press and hold the exposure compensation button to, to change the exposure compensation, then you can enable this and say you're shooting an aperture priority or shutter priority or any of the auto modes where the other dial is defunct by turning this on what will happen is whatever the dial is not working in that camera mode will basically take over the exposure compensation feature you don't have to press any buttons by just dialing that rear or the front dial you will be able to change the compensation so this might be cool for some shooters i personally don't mind pressing the button so i have mine turned off there's also the auto reset available there so with this one if you just want to make it a one-time thing and reset it after you turn the camera off you can select that all right, next we've got matrix metering, option B5, and this one says phase detection on and off. Now, this is not really the phase detection that you might th think about. It's not like tracking faces. What it's doing is actually looking at the skin tone. So if you're photographing a portrait, say it's a bride with a white dress, the system, the matrix metering sensor, will look at the scene, and if it detects any skin or facial features, it will actually modify the exposure to match the face or the skin of the person. So that way you might actually end up maybe overexposing the dress or maybe overexposing the blacks and underexposing whites. If you don't have phase detection turned off, with phase detection turned on, it doesn't really matter. It's not even going to pay attention to what's happening around the scene. It will simply try to get the best exposure on the person's skin or face. So I have this turned on, it's a neat feature, and I want, whenever I photograph people, I want to prioritize their skin. All right, next we've got the center weighted area. And this one is the one I don't touch, just set it to, keep it at 12, which is the default. All right, next we've got fine tune optimal exposure, and this one it will actually complain that there's a few things that will be altered. I don't mess with that, and I don't recommend that you mess with it either. All right. Now we're at timer slash AE lock. As you can see, section C. We've got four options here. We've got the shutter release button AEL. Now with this one, if you're shooting in any of the automated modes like aperture priority or shutter priority, whenever you have pressed the shutter button, it doesn't by default lock the exposure. So if you wanted to say focus and recompose, say you're photographing a landscape and you want to uh, you already have the optimal exposure for the foreground, but you do not want the camera to change the exposure when you point it up and say include the sun in the frame. If you turn this on, what will happen is when you half press that shutter button, whether you move from one side of the frame to another, your exposure will get locked. So say you're shooting at 1 100th of a second, ISO 100 and whatever aperture you set, then whenever you half press and keep holding that ha at half press position, the exposure will remain the same. I don't mess with that, I just keep that turned off because if I need to do that, I usually just switch to manual. But it could be a neat feature for uh, some certain situations. 
The standby timer is set to six seconds by default, and I personally don't mess with this. This is basically whenever you half press and your, your camera is metering and showing you the exposure values in the viewfinder or on top LCD, that's how long it takes before the information disappears. So I just keep it at six seconds, but if that's too short for you and you want to see that information for longer, you can set it here to longer periods of time. All right, next we got the self timer. This is if you want to shoot with a timer, there is the default is 10 seconds, but if you want to shorten it or maybe make it longer, this is where you do it from. And you can set number of shots to take. And also the last setting here is interval between shots. Now, you know, if unless you know again what you're doing, I wouldn't mess with these here. But if you wanted to say take multiple shots with a timer, this is where you do it from. All right, so the monitor off delay, and as you can see, there's a star, and I did this specifically for this video so that things don't turn off as I guide you through the menu. But the default settings are different for here. Basically, in the playback, the menus, the information display, and how long the image stays on when I press the play button, all that is controlled through here. All right, next we've got the beep. This is one thing that annoys pretty much anybody whenever you're shooting right next to them if they know what, you're, what they're doing because uh, the this is basically where you set different volume for beeps. So if you're taking a picture and you're half pressing and this goes beep, 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 beep all the time, it's really annoying. I always keep that turn off. And this is basically the pitch. You can set low or you can set high. All right, so the next setting is D2 and this is for a specific setting on the top of the camera here which has CL which is continuous low and you can set different frame rates. The default is three frames per second. I almost never use in continuous low mode anyway, so it doesn't really matter. But if you wanted to change that, this is where you do it from. Next, we got the, and by the way, we are right now under shooting slash display. As you can see, it's the, the new colors now, D. If I go back, now I'm under shooting and display. So now we have the max continuous release. Now this is the number of frames. If I press the help button, unfortunately it's not available. So this is something that you just need to know from this video. This is how many images will be captured before the camera will stop. So if I set this to a lower number, say 20, and I keep on pressing and, and keep and hold the shutter release, it will only capture 100 images before it will stop. But if you wanted to do like 20 images at most, then you could do it from here. I don't know why you would want to do that, but this is where you set it from. Next, we've got exposure delay mode, and this is actually a great feature because it allows me to use this camera without a remote shutter release. Now, if I'm shooting, say, on a tripod, and I do not have a remote shutter release with me, and I'm worried about camera shake caused by my hands, by selecting, say, three seconds, two seconds, whatever the, the amount of time is, the mirror will come up, the camera will wait for however long you have it selected, and then the shutter will engage. So if you don't have a very stable tripod and you press the shutter release and you're not going to be worried about the camera going off immediately. This is a really great feature. I use this all the time when doing landscape photography, but I get it turned off by default because I do not want the camera to wait for a specified amount of time if I'm doing handheld shooting. All right, next we've got electronic front curtain shutter. And this is a really cool feature that is also only available on newer Nikon DSLRs. This D810 has it, and some of the other uh, newer DSLRs also have it. What this allows me to do is you can enable it, which I always have it turned on, but in specific camera modes like live view or mirror lockup, whenever the, um, the mirror will already be in the upwards position and the shutter curtain will open. So basically, you will have a completely vibration-free experience with this mode. Once you have it turned on, if you're, say, in live view mode, well, there's no reason for the shutter to be engaged because it's already open. Well, the camera will start capturing the image, so there's no vibration whatsoever, and the shutter will only come down at the very end of exposure. So it's a really great feature to have. I always keep it on, but keep in mind that you have to be in one of the two modes for this to work. 
Next, we have the six file number sequence. I don't mess with this. Basically, you can, uh, whatever the file name is, say DSC001 or whatever the, the sequence is, you can have it follow that sequence. You can have it not follow the sequence and you can have it reset. Now, if I say reset, every time when I put a new memory card in, what will happen is it will start over from 001. The reason why I don't touch this is because it really doesn't matter. Whenever I import into Lightroom any other, or any other post-processing software, I will rename images anyway. All right, so next we've got the viewfinder grid display. This one I turn on because it allows me to frame images better and it actually, you can see through the viewfinder immediately as soon as you turn it on, it just gives you those grids. Next, we've got ISO display and adjustment and this is basically where you can select between show ISO sensitivity show ISO slash easy ISO or frame count. Now this ISO sensitivity, basically once you select that, on the top of the camera, you will be able to see the sensitivity, but it will not show you how many frames you've got left. Whereas if you go show ISO slash easy ISO, and this is the one that I usually keep turned on, what this will allow you to do is say you are in a particular mode and you just want to easily change ISO with the defunct uh, a dial, either say the front dial or the rear dial, depending on which mode you're shooting. In aperture priority mode, for example, the the one of the dials, the the rear dial, is the one that doesn't work. Well, if you have easy ISO turned on, it will basically the top display will not change. It will still show you the ISO, but then whenever you dial change the dial on the rear side then it will actually start changing ISO. So this is a really cool feature. On the previous Nikon DSLRs, this worked a little bit different. You could only select ISO, easy ISO, or frame count, but now there's an option to do both. So that's where I keep mine at. Next, we have screen tips, D9, and this one is turned on by default. Now, what this does is there's an info button on the back of the camera. If I press this button, you can see there's this kind of a fancy way or easy way for me to see all the data or the most important parts. And what I can do is I can press the I button and start changing, say, the shooting menu banks or different settings like ISO, active D-lighting, so on and so forth. And as you can see, whenever I move, it will actually show me tooltip saying what that is, color space or preview button, all that stuff. So if I go back to the menu and I turn that off, Whenever I go info and I, it will not show me. It's just no tooltips anymore. So it doesn't really matter. I really don't use that screen anyway, but I'll just keep that turned on by default. Under information display, we have two settings, auto and manual. This is basically, again, going back to that information display. When I press the info button, you can see it's white on black. Now, if I wanted to change it and swap it the other way around, I can go in here and say manual, make it dark on light. And now if I press the info, as you can see, now it's black on white. Again, I don't mess with that. Just keep it at auto default. LCD illumination is basically for the top screen. If I keep that turned on, it will instantly turn the top LCD, the, uh, the light on. And I keep that off because I don't want that. It, D12, MBD12, that's only if you have a battery grip. And you can select what type of batteries you use in that. Doesn't really matter if you don't have battery grip, which I practically never use with this D810, but if you did, then you, that's where you do it. And the battery order, you basically select which battery to use first, whether you wanna use the battery grip batteries first or the camera battery first. All right, next we've got E1. Now this is under the bracketing slash flash. I'm not gonna go into any of these options because really this is not about shooting flash, but if you wanted to change sync speed, shutter speed for the flash, flash control for built-in flash and do things like commander mode to, com to command other flashes, speed lights, Nikon speed lights that you have. This is basically where you do that all from. And there's modeling flash, like if you're using specific speed lights, all these things that you basically can control from your camera for flash. I'm not gonna worry about it again. Next we have F, which is controls. So under controls, We've got multiple things, and looks like there's a few settings to go over. Lots of them, actually. All right, so F1 switch. What this does is I have LCD backlight and light bulb info, light bulb, and information display. What does this do? If I just do LCD backlight, and on the top 
of the camera whenever you turn the camera you can actually turn the camera on you can actually go the other way when I go the other way it allows me to turn the LCD backlight well if I wanted to turn the LCD backlight and display the information display I keep this turn on and what happens now if I toggle that I have the light on top of the camera and at the same time as you can see it switched to the info screen now I really don't use that info screen doesn't matter for me so I just go back to the default but if you want to do that that's an option F2 multi selector center button this is a really cool feature this is something that you absolutely have to do I always tell people this will save you a lot of time and many people praise this feature which is deeply hidden within the camera I wish Nikon enabled this by default what it allows you to do is allows you to in different modes set specific functions for the center button on the rear multi-function selector so here I've got shooting mode and you can see there's reset preset focus point and all that which in, if you're in shooting mode basically what you do I don't really touch any of this stuff to be honest uh, and live view the same way if you're in live view mode and you set the uh, uh, press the center button it will just move the center focus point back to where it started just like in this in the shooting mode now in playback mode this is the one that I've been talking about basically what you can do is when you're pressing the play button and you're looking at an image I really do not want to have the default behavior which is if this is the image that I'm looking at and I press the center button look at what happens it switches to this grid showing me multiple images I don't want that like it's just pointless to do this for me but I would what I really love doing is going back and if I click controls multi selector center button playback mode I do zoom on and off and look at this low magnification one to one high magnification there's no reason to do high just because everything is gonna look pixelated but look what happens if I select one to one ratio press play I'm gonna zoom in once and I'm going to press the the center button boom zooms in to 100% now why is this amazing if I'm looking through what I've done so if I'm gonna go into images and say I want to check focus on a particular image that looks like this is a wedding here I'm just going to just pick a random image say this one and I want to see well did I actually focus on the bride's eyes I press the center button and instantly I can see 100% view so this is a great great feature because it saves a lot of time look at how many times I have to zoom out just to be able to get to 100% view and if I wanted to check focus I'd have to go one two three four five six seven eight that many times to see the same thing I have to press the button eight times whereas with the center button boom instant zoom out boom instant zoom in I think it was actually nine this is looking bigger so anyway that is a really neat feature to have absolutely must have every camera that I have has this one-to-one -one ratio turned on by default on some older cameras you want to see one to one you will see like high magnification or like certain percentages whatever it is just set it to what you like the best but this is a huge time saver for me whenever I go from image to image it allows me to see right away where was the focus and do I have it nailed or not so this is really cool all right that's about it for multi selector center button that's the only thing that I actually change next we've got the actual multi selector and from here you can basically do nothing which is the default action or you can restart the standby timer now I'm not sure why you would even want to use this I set it to do nothing which is a default behavior but basically if you wanted to restart the standby timer remember that six second timer that we set earlier for the camera to display that exposure information if you wanted to extend that and and just restart it and show it again this is where you do it from anytime when you go up down or press anything on the multi selector it will display that exposure information again I just go do nothing because I really don't need that all right next we've got the assign function button and this is something where you can actually customize the dial on the on the bottom as you can see there is a function button on this Nikon D810 and I can select different things here I can do weighted metering highlight weighted metering viewfinder grid display all these different things now this is a personal preference everybody chooses what works for them 
I sometimes go and select, I really don't care about the virtual horizon. I almost never use that thing. And um, I just go with my menu. Now what that allows me to do, once I have that function button set to the menu, if I press that button, as you can see, it goes directly into my menu, which is really cool because there are certain things that I like to add to my menu and access them very quickly. So if I didn't want to go menu and then select, go into my menu and just wanted to have one button that does it, that would be the place to set it from. So I'm gonna go back to controls. That's what I set it mine to, but again, it's a personal preference. Sometimes people prefer to use the access top item in my menu, which whatever is your most frequently used menu setting, if you do that, then by pressing the button, it will go directly to whatever you had selected on the very top. Now, we're gonna come to my menu in a second, but basically this is where you would choose that action from. All right, so I'm gonna go back to my menu and next we've got a sign preview button. Now, if I go here, you can see there is another button on top of the function button and it's called the preview button. By default, it does the exposure preview. Now, I personally don't use this exposure preview like ever, but I know some people do and it allows them to look inside the viewfinder. It will basically stop down the lens to whatever aperture you have set and it will allow you to see how much depth of field you're getting and what the actual exposure will look like. And the problem with this is that it will actually darken the image really badly, especially if you have a very small aperture. So I really don't bother with this and just pick any of these settings. Like if I wanted to do AF on, that's where I would do it from normally. Again, I don't just mess with this but you could see there's a lot of different options for you to choose from. So maybe I'll do my menu for the function and top menu for the preview button, uh, or maybe if I wanna do things like playback, all this stuff is available. Just choose whatever works for you. All right, so next, also you will notice that in some place it will say press and command dials. Now what this does is you basically have a different list of things because these are selections. So you can't just choose an image area by pressing a button. You have to press the button and toggle between those different things. So if I wanted to do that, I can go here and say, all right, I'm gonna choose this, and these are the selections that are available. If I select okay now, it will go, whenever I press that preview button, it will basically allow me to hold that preview button and then use the dial on the, on the camera to select between different image areas. Or say if I wanted to do things like active delighting or exposure delay mode, this is actually really nice. I could do this one. And if I set this one, well, by pressing that preview button, I can actually select between the different exposure delay modes. All right, so next we've got the assign AEL AFL button. Now on this Nikon D810, there's two buttons on the rear. They're on the rear where my thumb is. There's an AF on and AEL slash AFL, which is auto exposure lock and autofocus lock. Now you can program this to different things as well. And this is basically allowing me to go through all these different settings and setting them. Very similar to what my other buttons do or uh, the, the list is very similar to what I see for the preview and the function button. But this is another way for you to be able to customize that behavior. So if you're doing certain things and you want to have quick access to say matrix metering, by using that button and you don't care about locking your exposure or, or your autofocus, this is where you do it from. And again, same thing, holding and rotating the dial, this is where it's done from. All right, so I just keep that as default. I don't mess with this. I like having the access to AEL for locking exposure and autofocus. So I don't mess with that. Now with this one, as you can see, I have shutter speed lock grayed out. And the reason why it's grayed out is because I am in aperture priority mode. And the only thing that I can lock is aperture. Now this is for me to lock aperture so that I don't accidentally change it. I don't know why I would do that, but if I wanted to keep that aperture at a particular setting, this is where I do it from. If I change my camera mode to shutter priority mode, then the top option is going to be enabled and the bottom option will disappear. And if I'm in manual mode, I will see both. Now, if I switch to shutter priority mode, as you can see now I've got the shutter speed 
lock enabled, but the aperture lock is now grayed out. And if I go to complete manual mode, both of them become available. So if I'm shooting in manual mode and I do not want to accidentally change my shutter speed or my aperture, I can lock both and whether I change the dials or move the dials, nothing will actually change the shutter speed or the aperture. I don't know why I would want to use this, but if you are shooting in a specific environment, maybe you want to just lock those, this is where you do it from. The assign bracketing button is by default set to allow me to toggle between the different bracketing options. But if I didn't want that and wanted to say change it to multiple exposure mode or HDR, this is where I would do this from. HDR wouldn't work for raw images anyway, so, and I really don't see much need for multiple exposure. I just keep mine at auto bracketing. Under customized command dials, there's a way for you to actually make a few changes to the default behavior of certain buttons and functions. So here, for example, you can uh, change the rotation and you can reverse it for exposure compensation, shutter speed aperture. So for example, if you're in shutter priority and you are bugged by the fact that the front dial changes the aperture and you would rather have the rear dial change the aperture, this is the area where you can do it from. So one setting that is really neat and useful and that's the only one that I change because I'm okay with the default settings is menus and playback and here I have this turned on first and I'll explain what this does but basically by enabling the menus and playback in on you can enable the sub dial frame advance and this is something that the uh, Canonites would really love and Nikon shooters for a long very long time didn't have this feature allows you to skip certain number of frames when you're reviewing them. So for example, if I press playback and say, well, I want to go jump from 54 to 84, instead of going one, two, three, one by one, I can actually just rotate the front dial and it jumps 10 frames at a time. Now this is really cool because it allows me to go through the images very quickly. If I had to go all the way to 500 image, I could actually speed this up by going into the command dials and setting the advancing to 50 frames. Now look at what's going to happen. It's just going to jump 50 frames at a time. So this is really cool. Something that Canonize always had on their cameras and now Nikon incorporated it. So I have this turned on by default. But anyway, so if you are not happy with any of the default behavior, this is where you make the changes from. F10 or release button to use dial allows you to basically control the behavior of the buttons. So for example, if I wanted to have the camera mode changed, I'd have to press the camera mode and then keep holding it in order to be able to change the camera mode. Well, if I don't like that, if I just want to press it once to be able to change it without having to keep holding it, I'll switch this to yes. By doing that, I can easily change from say manual mode to aperture priority mode, I'd only have to press the button once and it will allow me to toggle between the different camera modes. Whereas if I have it set to no, I have to hold a press and hold the, uh, the mode button. Slot empty release lock is basically if you are shooting without a memory card, do you want the camera to fire or not? And this one I actually changed. I set it to release locked because the worst thing that, you, that can happen to you is you're shooting out, you're going to a very important event, maybe you're out shooting and you have no memory card inserted and you assume that there's a memory card and you keep on shooting only to figure out later that there was no memory card in your camera. So I just have this locked. So if I don't have a memory card or if there's a problem, it will not even fire. By default, it's set to release. All right, and now we're at reverse indicators. Now this is something that you might not like when you look through the viewfinder, you'll see there's a minus on the left and plus on the right by default with the zero in the center. Now, if you want to swap that out, this is where you do this from. So once you do this, you will see that if you're overexposing, it will now move towards the left side instead of the right side. And if you're underexposing, now it will do the reverse. So I don't mind having the default behavior. I don't mess with that. Now, another really cool feature that is only available on the most recent Nikon DSLRs, this actually became available with a firmware upgrade on some DSLRs like the D800. You have the ability to assign the movie record button to actually do something useful. 
So if you're in live view mode, well, the default behavior for the movie record is to re start recording the movie. But if you're not in the live view mode, it actually does nothing. Well, if I go here now and I set it to say ISO sensitivity, which is the most useful feature you can have with this button, well, guess what? You don't have to reach to the top of the camera with your second hand just to change the ISO. A lot of people complained for, to Nikon for many years to enable something like this. And this was a great feature that was finally added to Nikon DSLRs. So if you have the movie record button, selecting this allows you to just press that button with your index finger and you can change ISO. This is really cool, really easy way to change ISO. Now remember, there's also easy ISO that we talked about earlier. So uh, if you're shooting in any of the program modes, whether it's like uh, aperture priority or shutter priority mode, you can choose your rear dial to actually change ISO as well. So you can change it from multiple places now. F14 live view button options is actually another potentially useful feature for people who get annoyed by the live view button. So if you accidentally end up pressing the live view button and you do not want that to be engaged at all, all you have to do is disable it. And now if I press the live view button, it does absolutely nothing. So this might be cool for people who never go into live view or if you're shooting a wedding or something very important and you do not want to potentially end up in live view mode, you can just simply disable it from there. I just leave that turned on by default just because I use Live View quite a bit, especially for focusing when I photograph landscapes. So that's on by default. All right, 15, you've got a sign MBD12 AF on button. That's only if you have the battery grip MBD12 and there's an AF on button on there. You can actually assign it to do different things. I just keep it at the default AF on. F16 assign remote WR function button. This is only applicable if you have a wireless remote control and it's a specific remote control. If I go to any of these settings and press help, it says assign the function button on the wireless remote controller, the role of live view button, for example. So if you have a wireless remote control, this is basically where you can change the behavior of that function button. Not particularly useful, but might be useful to some people that actually own that unit. F17 lens focus function buttons. Now with this one, you have a bunch of different settings here. And what this allows you to do is if you have a lens, say a super telephoto lens that actually has a function button on it, you can change the default behavior. So by default, the function button on lenses like that, it will lock the focus on the lens, but you can change things like AF area mode, you can do all these different things, which is kind of cool. Before you had no way to change that, but now you can. All right, so, and again, I, I don't mess with this. It only works with specific lenses. We are at the very end. Now we are at movies and that's section G. Like I said, the movie functions have been actually moved on the Ni newer Nikon DSLRs to a separate dedicated menu. But from here, if you're in a movie mode, you can, change the behavior of the function button, preview button, the AEL, AFL button, and then the shutter button for different things like record movies or take photos. So if you do uh, DSLR videos, then you might want to use these features. I don't touch these because I normally don't shoot video. All right, so that's really it with the custom setting menus. Now let's jump to the setup menu. Now the setup menu is far less complex than the custom settings menu because there, these things are only for you to be able to change the way your camera is set up. So the very, at the very top, we have the uh, format memory card option. So if I select that, I would be able to format the contents of that memory card. The monitor brightness is for you to be able to basically pick between darker to brighter values. Now you're not seeing these changes because we're outputting it to the video, but if, if I'm going to higher value, the monitor or the LCD is going to get brighter. And if I'm going to go lower value, it's going to get darker. Now, if you want to preserve battery life and maybe you're shooting somewhere in a remote location with no way to charge your, your battery, I always set my brightness to the lowest level. This is supposed to, in theory, consume less power. 
The monitor color balance is a new feature that was added by Nikon in response to people who complained about the way that colors appeared on the rear LCD. There was this whole discussion about green tint on some Nikon DSLRs. So Nikon allows now for you to be able to calibrate the way that the colors appear on the screen. Now, I'm not gonna be able to show you these changes because again, we're just outputting directly from, from the camera and recording that. But on the LCD, as I'm moving this, I can actually see changes. Right now it's showing more reds and on this side it's showing more blues, on this side it's showing more greens. So if you wanted to tweak the output, this is where you do it from. Now the clean image sensor option allows you to have the camera create micro vibrations to try to remove that dust that might potentially be sitting on it. Now it's not a very good feature to have honestly and if, you, if I select clean now it will try to shake off that dust but unfortunately most of the time dust that ends up on the sensor tends to stick to it. So if you really want to clean it you should just find ways to clean it physically rather than using this feature. But if there is debris or, or dust that is easy to remove or it maybe is just sitting there and it's not glued to the sensor, then maybe having this clean now option to do the cleaning now or maybe have the camera clean at startup every time when you turn the camera or maybe when you turn off the camera, you could set these options. I personally don't do this. I just set cleaning off. All right, next we've got image dust off reference photo. Now this is for situations where you have dust on the sensor and you're just tired of seeing dust in every image. You could actually create an image which basically captures the image with the dust sitting on it and then when you capture next images, it will try to remove that dust from the images. Now, as you can see, the lock mirror up for cleaning option is grayed out. And the reason why it's grayed out is because I am actually running low on the battery. But if I wanted to be able to clean the sensor physically, then I would have to charge the battery first and I would see that option. So if I wanted to do a sensor maintenance, if I wanted to say use the wet cleaning method or use a sensor gel stick or some other solution to maintain and clean my sensor, then I would first have to charge the battery fully. It's actually a good prevention mechanism. By graying it out, if you run out of battery while cleaning your sensor, you do not risk potentially damaging the mirror mechanism or even the sensor. So anyway, next we've got image dust off reference photo. Now this option is for cameras that have dust on the sensor. And if you want the camera to attempt to remove the dust on different images and you have no way to clean up the sensor, this is basically where you take a reference photo and then the subsequent images that you capture, the camera will try to remove dust from the images. Now, I personally don't use this feature simply because I prefer to have my sensor clean, but this is another option for you to explore. I don't even know what it's going to do if you have large dust particles, so it's probably best that you just maintain your sensor and keep it clean at all times. Now, the flicker reduction option is specifically created for environments where you have artificial lighting with, say, fluorescent or mercury vapor light bulbs. And in those situations, there is a potential for those light sources to create flicker effect where portion of the frame will appear darker and it's going to look weird. So if you want to try to reduce that, you can actually see if the camera can automatically match it or you can specify 50 hertz or 60 hertz to try to match that. Next, we've got time zone and date. And here you can select your time zone, which in this case, I've got it set to Denver time because I live in Denver and you can select uh, and change your date time and date format. In this case, I have month slash date slash year. That's just the way that those appear in images. I've got daylight saving time turned on, but you can disable it from here if you want to. Now from here, I go to language. And if you speak any other language and prefer to see things in or menu settings in different languages, this is where you set it from. Auto image rotation is something that is absolutely essential to have. And the reason why you want to have this is because whenever you capture an image, if you switch from horizontal to say vertical orientation, you want that information preserved in the image. There's a separate setting for displaying an image, which I showed you earlier. If I go to 
the playback menu, there is a setting here that says rotate tall. Now all this does is changes the way that the image is displayed when, whenever you switch from horizontal to vertical or from landscape to portrait orientation. Now this setting in particular, what it does is it's very different from the other function. Here it's basically going to save the orientation into the image itself. So if I shoot vertical and whenever I import that image into say Lightroom, I want Lightroom to automatically recognize that I shot in vertical orientation. If I turn this off, it will not save that information. So it's best to keep this turned on. It would be really annoying if I had to go and change orientation in thousands of images like I have in this wedding uh, after I import the images. So I always have that turned on. Battery info allows me to see how much charge I have left on this battery. And as you can see, I've got 30%. And then the battery age is how old the battery is. And as you can see, this battery is fairly new. So I still have plenty of life left in it. But if it pushes to the right, it's time for you to replace that battery. Image comment is if you want to attach comments to images. So basically, whatever images you capture in the camera, it would attach whatever text you type in here. As you can see, you have two lines. And this is kind of painful because you have to select one letter at a time. I personally don't bother with attaching comments, but if you wanted to, you could do that and it becomes part of that exit data or header information. Don't forget to check attach comment. Otherwise, whatever you input here will not actually get attached. Now the copyright information is actually something I would definitely recommend enabling and attaching to images because it will basically embed your copyright information to every raw or JPEG image. Now from here, I could say, all right, this is going to be copyright me. So I could go and just pick bracket. This is going to take a long time because you have to do this one by one. And I could say, all right, I'm just going to pick whatever my name and I could add my last name in there as well. So once you have that, you can hit OK. But if you, the biggest problem with this is it takes so long to type all this. And then a lot of people get confused by like, how do I go back? If you made a mistake, it's kind of a pain to go back and delete it. Because what you need to do is you need to press that on the bottom. You can see there's like this, uh, the, the selector, the zoom button that you have to press. And then you have to actually go to the front of this text. Then you can press the the trash button to delete whatever you type. It's really painful. I don't like that. But anyway, if you wanted to do that and you want to take your time, you basically type in your information. That's your name here. You click OK. And once you do that, you can actually attach your copyright information in here as well. And you could just type in your, you know, your contact information, maybe your phone number, whatever else you want to add into that copyright field. So here is your name. Here is your copyright information. And again, don't forget to check attach copyright information or none of the stuff that you type here is going to apply, be applied to images. All right, so from here we have save load settings. If you want to save everything you've done, say you're upgrading from one camera to another, or maybe you want to give all your settings to your friend, your coworker, whoever, or maybe someone over the internet, this is where you do it from. If I hit save settings, it will allow me to save everything that I have in this camera, as far as settings are concerned, into the memory card. And then if somebody gives you a file and says, hey, load up my settings, this is where you basically put that savings, uh, the, the settings file into the memory card, and then you go into the load settings, which will allow you to load that. So in this memory card right here, I already just saved it. And as you can see, the load settings option is there. So if I select that, it will simply select everything that I have saved so far. So maybe you have ideal settings that you want to preserve and that's the way you do it. But don't forget that whenever you change the memory card, all that stuff will be gone because it will be saved to that specific memory card. All right. So from here, we've got virtual horizon, which allows you to see different levels. So if I actually start moving the camera up and down, you can see this is how it rotates left, right, and then up, down, that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, could be useful for framing and other purposes. I personally don't use it. Next, we've got the non-CPU lens data. Now, if you're shooting with a really old lens that doesn't have CPU contacts, and I have a bunch of those that I bought a while ago from eBay, you can actually set 
that information on that lens. Now this is for the Noct Nikkor 58mm 1.2 that I was playing with and I have the focal length set and maximum aperture set. Now the reason why you want to do that is because if the lens doesn't have CPU contacts, if it's not a smart lens, if it's one of those old lenses without any chip inside, then what will happen is the camera will have no idea what focal length you're using and what maximum aperture you're using. So if you wanted to set aperture or if you wanted to get the, your metering correctly and if you wanted your focal length to be part of the information within the image, this is where you set it from. And you can select multiple options here. You can go all the way to nine, so from one to nine, you can program up to nine different lenses. All right, from here we go to a fine tune. Now this is something I would not recommend that you mess with, but if you have specific lenses, and in this case I have a Nikon 85 millimeter lens, and as you can see, it has plus 10 saved. Now this is a very kind of detailed process, and it takes a long time for you to be able to do that. Don't just start putting some values in here because you have to find a way to properly measure for a specific lens that you're using what the optimal fine tuning settings are going to be. So for my 85 millimeter lens, I had to dial plus 10 to have a very accurate focus. For other lenses, it's going to be different. So something to keep in mind, a fine tune on off, this is where you turn the whole feature on or off. Then whatever the save value is. So for this lens, which is 85 millimeter 1.4, it's plus 10. Now, if I switch the lens to something different, then if I have previously saved settings for that lens, it will actually change it. But if I didn't want to save it, I don't have to save it. I don't have to go into the save value. I can just choose a default value, which basically now, whatever I type in, every lens that I attach, it will by default apply that. So don't mess with this if you don't know what this is. I wrote actually a very detailed article on how to use a fine tune feature and how to calibrate your lenses. So if you wanna do that, go ahead and do that. This is where you basically see the database of lenses that you previously changed the setting for. And as you can see, I've got three lenses that I've saved here. But if you have more lenses, you can save up to 20 different lenses. All right, so we're approaching the end here and we've got HDMI, which is something I don't mess with, but you can change the resolution here. You can go to advanced and do things like live view, on-screen display, output range. Don't worry about that because this is for displaying whatever your camera is showing you. Location data is for a GPS. Now for the D810 and many other Nikon DSLRs, you would have to have an external GPS receiver. But if you have one attached to the camera, this is where you set different options for that unit. Now network, as you can see, is disabled. And the reason why it's disabled is because it's also specific for an accessory. You would have to have a specific Wi-Fi or an Ethernet enabled device that you attach to the camera. And once you do that, then you can go into the network settings and make changes. And if you want to find out what firmware version you're running on the camera, you can just go here. And as you can see, the uh, firmware is 1.00 and there's a lens firmware 2.005. So if you want to upgrade to the latest version, just find out whatever is available on NikonUSA.com or whichever is local to you and find out if it's version, say, 1.01, .01, then you can actually upgrade it. If so, if you don't know what firmware you're running, this is where you look it up. And uh, there are specific instructions on how to upgrade your firmware that you can find on Nikon websites. All right. Now we have reached the retouch menu. And for me, this is the most useless menu because I simply never even go here because this is from where you can make specific changes to JPEG images. This does not impact raw files. Remember, raw files, raw data, you cannot make changes to them. So, But if you have JPEG images and you wanted to apply specific corrections, you could make these corrections. Keep in mind, it's not going to do anything to the raw file. So not anything that I'm particularly interested in, but if you wanted to give it a try, do resizing, straightening, distortion control, I don't know why you would ever want to edit images in your camera. Anyway, I will skip this section completely. 
Now the My Menu tab is a really neat feature because it allows me to actually pick things from the menu without having to go through all these extensive list of things. So what I can do is I can go to Add Items and it will allow me to pick from the different tabs. So if say I wanted to add the ISO sensitivity options, which is something that I will always have in that menu because I access that all the time. All I have to do is come here and press OK. Now I can do this on multiple levels. That's a neat part of this. So if I wanted the entire branch of ISO sensitivity settings to be available, I just press OK. By doing that, now if I go to my menu and as you can see on the very top, I've got ISO sensitivity settings, I can actually go and this appears exactly like it would appear in the shooting menu if I were to go to ISO sensitivity. So right here is basically the same. Now, if I said, well, I don't really care for auto ISO, I just want ISO sensitivity. Well, guess what? You can do that too. Just go to add items, shooting menu, and you can see that I have an arrow pointing to the right. I could do that and I could say, you know what? I only want ISO sensitivity. Now, if I click OK, now check this out. I've got ISO sensitivity, which only allows me to select ISO. And then I've got the settings, which allows me to set both ISO and the auto ISO sensitivity controls. Now, I don't do just the ISO sensitivity, so I'm going to go ahead and delete that. Yes. All right. But there might be a few things that you might prefer that to add without having to go through and dig all these different things in the camera. So if you wanted to say, just provide the option for image quality or the primary slot selection, all that stuff you could just do here. And in many cases, I actually want to do things from the custom setting menu just so that I don't have to go and dig. Like the ones that I will definitely add is AF activation because I want to be able to change that quickly. Another one that I will add is, let's see, it's going to be, all right, oh, it's going to be under the timer, okay? I'm going to select the exposure delay mode, which I really love using. And by adding these options, you can see that I can actually move it up and down. So if I wanted to actually rank items, I could say, you know what, I want this at the very top. So I just select this and I move it up and that's where it goes and maybe AF activation is the one that I use less often and exposure delay mode is the third less often, uh, least option that I use. So in here, now there's a very quick way for me to access that. So now I don't have to go into the custom settings. I can toggle the AF on and the shutter AF on here, or I could set my exposure delay mode here. So this is something really, really great. If you have specific things that you want to add, that's where you do this from. Now you can change the way the My Menu tab behaves. You can actually select recent settings instead of My Menu. Now, right, I don't have anything selected because I actually didn't change anything, but let's just say I go to autofocus and mess with the priority selection. The moment I change stuff, it's going to appear in this list. So if there are things that you want to just be able to see from the last things that you've changed in the camera, by enabling the recent settings, you're basically showing whatever changes you've made recently to the camera. I personally don't find this very valuable and I'm gonna go back and select those because I really like the My Menu better. I would rather have these things that are there at all times. Now, if you remember, we actually changed the behavior of the front buttons to go to My Menu and this is actually the cool part. If I am somewhere here or maybe I'm reviewing an image and I just wanted to quickly jump to my menu, all I have to do is press the function button on the front of the camera and by doing that, boom, I'm right there. And if you remember, there was a setting for me to actually change another button so that it jumps to the very first setting. So if I wanted to go to ISO sensitivity settings without even having to go through the menu at all, all I have to do is program that and it will jump into this very first option. So a really neat feature, a quick way for you to make changes to the camera settings. All right, that's about wraps it up. I hope that was extensive enough for you to be able to make changes to your camera. Now, if you end up messing up your camera settings, let's say you went through all these things and just 
did some things and you have no idea what you've done, but your camera is not behaving the way that it should or used to, then what you can do is you can actually reset things to camera defaults. By doing that, you lose everything, but at least you get that initial functionality. So if you wanted to reset everything and wanted to go back to all the default settings, remove all these stars from the menus that we've made changes to, all you have to do is basically reset it using the buttons. On this Nikon D810, I have to press two green buttons, which is basically the qual button on the top of the camera, which is quality. And then I have to press the exposure compensation button. If I hold them, it will reset the camera to default settings. Once I do that, all these stars will disappear and then I have to go back and make all the changes. So just keep that in mind. It will not save what you've done before. So if you start over, don't forget the most important settings, which is to go back and change obviously your, uh, your image quality to raw and a few other settings. So just keep that in mind. If you run into a situation like that, you can easily reset the camera.